Russia has infiltrated American politics, mostly through the Republican Party and largely through Donald Trump. We know this, and yet we've somehow all been gaslighted, exhausted, or tricked into sending it down the memory hole. This is Beyond Politics, the show where we go beyond just politics to look at what's going on underneath in America. I'm Matt Robeson with my co-host, former U.S. Congressman Paul Hodes. And in this episode, we're starting a look at a bigger picture that's so obvious, and yet we seem to have let it recede into the background of our lives. We're going to look at this in a bunch more upcoming podcasts and videos on the Blue Amp channel on YouTube and in other media. But today, we want to begin at the beginning with a set of facts that are a matter of public record, but I bet you've forgotten about them. I have to admit, I did too. By the end of this, we hope we've reminded you of how the KGB began recruiting Donald Trump in the early 1980s and about how all of his behavior since then confirms that whether he's aware of it or not, he is very much an asset of Russia. And we created a conduit for Russia to manipulate and control senior Republicans. I was reminded of all of this in reading a fantastic Substack article from Greg Oliar called Prevail. You can find it and his awesome podcast, by the way, also called Prevail on Substack or wherever you get your podcasts. Two years ago, as we record this, almost to the day, Greg wrote an article on Prevail called Trump Cower Moscow. See what he did there? The subhead reads, the KGB began recruiting Trump in the early 1980s. The prevailing evidence and his behavior shows he is owned by Russia. Why are we still not talking about this? This has become so relevant again right now because of the recent arrest of former top FBI official Charles McGonigal, the special agent in charge of counterintelligence in the FBI's New York field office. Because he went to work for Putin right-hand man, Russian oligarch Oleg Deripaska, directly tied to Russian intelligence and Paul Manafort and the Trump campaign. So we're learning more and more about how the explosion of evidence of Russian infiltration of our politics in 2016 and 2017 was just a tip of an iceberg that goes very deep and is very much still with us today. So let's understand where all of this came from. Greg, so happy to have you on the show. Hey, thanks so much for asking. You write in the article that I referenced at the top there that there is a ton of reporting about how the KGB started a long game of cultivating Donald Trump as an asset going back almost 50 years. Tell us about that. Okay, before we get started on that, there's so much there and we get lost in the weeds so much that sometimes the things are very obvious and in our face. So before we go back to 1980, let's start like... He fired Comey, Trump did. He fired Comey because Comey was investigating the Russia ties. And the day after he fired Comey, he let two Russians into the Oval Office. Kislyak and Lavrov was laughing with them like they were old buddies and bragging about how he was off the hook now about with the Russia thing because he fired Comey. And then he replaced Comey with Chris Ray who, when he worked at the law firm, the law firm's largest client was Gazprom, which is the Russian state's gas and oil concern. This is really obvious. I'm actually glad you started there because it's like you're almost trying to camouflage yourself in the very inane obviousness of what you're doing. I think that's part of it. And you referenced the photo, the famous photo. That photo is from the Russian press services because Trump did not allow the U.S. press service to take any pictures that day. Oh my God. Uh, like <laughs> It's a red flag with a hammer and sickle on it. You know what I'm saying? Trump nice. has been consistently through since at least 1980, sympathetic, shall we say, to, to the Soviet Union and now Russia and all of those forces. In the piece, I reference reporting by Craig Unger, who wrote this book called American Compromise, which I think everybody should go read. He has a great source, Shvets, who was a long time, worked for the KGB during the 70s, early 80s, and knew what was going on. He defected and wound up going into business with um, good guys working in the, in the U.S. And uh, he said it began in 1980 at an electronics store in New York City where Trump was going to buy TVs, was known to be or thought to be at, like a hub of Soviet intelligence operations. So since then, they targeted the guy and it never really stopped. In 1987, before that, in 1984, I believe, his Trump Tower starts selling condos to known conduits to Russian organized crime figures. This is also Craig's reporting. And not technically, I guess, illegal, but at the time in the mid 80s in New York City, it wasn't common for shell companies to buy condominiums. Trump was one of only two people that did it, that allowed it. And because the money's coming in from crime and they don't, a lot of people at that time didn't want to deal with that. 
But Trump preferred, according to Craig and these other sources, to deal with crooks because they weren't going to sue him. Winds up going to, to Moscow with Ivana, his first wife, who is from Czechoslovakia, whose parents were hardline communists. And going so, back as far as 1977, Czech intelligence, which would have been sharing their intel with the KGB as allies, as, they, as all the Eastern Bloc countries did at the time, th- they were surveilling the Trumps, including in New York, Anna and Donald. So, so th- there's a link here. They've been the KGB radar for a long time. Yeah. And he goes to Moscow in 87. He stays at whatever the fancy hotel is there. It's obviously bugged and all this stuff. Who knows what he was doing? But and immediately comes home and announces he's going to run for president in 1988. He forms an exploratory committee. It's around this time he first hooks up with Roger Stone, goes to New Hampshire, gives a speech. And basically after that, before he went to Moscow, he was pretty local in his concerns and selfish. And after he came back, he any time he took some sort of position, it was usually aligned with something that Russia wanted. You say between 1988 and 2016, as, been, as has been widely and extensively reported, Trump began to launder money extensively for the Russian mafia to the point where he was, in effect, mob property, if not an outright asset of the Russian intelligence services. In practical terms, there is no real difference between Russian organized crime and Russian intelligence. And as ex-KGB officer Yuri Schwetz put it, quote, the whole Trump organization was turned into a money laundering front for the Russian intelligence community. What happened? When they recruit guys, when they recruit potential assets in intelligence. They're looking for people that they can get to in a variety of ways. I think it's called mice, right? Is that what it is? It's a money, ideology, compromat, and ego. And he, they must have looked at his dossier and been like, oh my God, this is- Ego. You know, all of you were born Trump? to play. Yeah. <laughs> With Trump, it was more vanity and money and all, of, like all of the things. Like, I think they just were like, this is almost too easy. I don't think it has anything to do with ideology. I think they flatter him. I think they give him what he wants. And I think it's an easy way for him to make money. And that's just what he's been up to, you know? Yeah, I want to be clear about that last point there. You don't have to be a willing participant in a Russian active measure operation to still be a Russian asset. Let me repeat that and say it a little bit more plainly. It's quite possible that Trump is a useful idiot for the Russians. It's quite possible that he's doing what they want without realizing it. Because there are a couple of known facts here. Trump is not that intelligent. We certainly know that from his needing to fabricate his grades in order to get into college. And he has a giant ego and he's easily manipulated. So in 2016, Paul Manafort enters the picture. And wow, is this fishy. He's hired by the campaign, as you write, for free because he's so deeply in hock to his Russian overlords that he's willing to work for free because he needs to literally indentured servitude style pay off his debt to a Russian oligarch. We can get to that. One of his trusted colleagues was Konstantin Kalimnik, who is a Russian intelligence officer and also the right-hand man of Oleg Deripaska. I know I'm throwing Uh. a lot of Russian names at you, but- This is a very tightly woven set of Russian intelligence, Russian oligarchs, Russian right-hand men to Vladimir Putin. The reporting of all of this, even though all of this was known, was like, oh, he's an experienced hand in Republican circles. He once ran a Republican convention. This makes sense that he was hired to get Donald Trump on track. When he was fired in August of 2016, the New York Times lead story about it by Maggie Haberman says, (laughs) In the fourth paragraph, in the fourth paragraph mentions, oh, there was a little flap with him taking Russian money and buries it down to the 24th paragraph where she finally belatedly mentions, yeah, there's a little scandal brewing here. The entire focus was, oh, he wasn't really doing what the Trump campaign wanted him to do. And so it's like the media was, I don't know what, sort of lulled into a sense of nothing to see here. What do we know about this whole Manafort episode. I, you, as you correctly say, when Manafort came aboard, Trump had sewn up the votes, but there was a lot, of, there was a movement led by Ted Cruz where the convention, the RNC, that summer was going to be contested because there, there appeared to be enough people that didn't want Trump that they were going to unite together and somehow pull something to, to make Cruz the man. I don't know how much 
better that would have been. I think they're not the same. But his father was... did ass assassinate JFK. So, you know. <laughs> so Manafort, as a younger, much younger operative, did preside over and manage the RNC. And I think it was 76, which was a contested convention with Ford and Ronald Reagan. So he had experience, like real experience doing this, which no one else really did. But he came in and the last place he worked was Ukraine. And I think now, certainly, especially now after the invasion, as February, we know now what that's all about. And that's who Manafort worked, Manafort worked for in Ukraine. So he did the same dirty tricks that they tried in the U.S. They had done in Ukraine also, right down to there was a woman running against them and they did the lock her up thing. It was all that they did actually wind up locking her up. If you want to know about Manafort now, you can just read volume five of the Senate Intelligence Committee's report because it's all about Manafort and Kalimnik, who the report, the bipartisan report says is a Russian intelligence officer. So who specializes in election fuckery? That's who Manafort was with all the time and the thinking is or at least it appears that him working for the trump campaign is a okay instead of paying you back i'm just going to tell you what i know and he in certain emails and communications according to volume five this is what came to pass he was trying to play up his insider status to the trump campaign to as some sort of payback to deripaska who wanted to get off the sanctions list and all that kind of stuff. Remember, the context here is there was this explosion at the time of Russian involvement in campaigns. The Trump campaign was the harbinger, but you see all of these in trader, the Victor Vekelsberg cousin who's now been tied up with George Santos. All of a sudden, he starts giving rampant campaign donations in 2017. In this time frame, he gives 86 contributions all to Republicans with one exception, Tulsi Gabbard, do with that what you will. But I, it's just, <laughs> same, again, same, same. Yeah. yeah, I would just love to know what was going on. The question I keep coming back to is, why has the reporting about all this been so under the radar? It's been like a collective shrug for the media. Did they get gaslighted by Bill Barr and the Durham investigation? Did what Was Mueller just so overwhelming with all of his information that nobody could digest it. It's a good question. And probably the fate of democracy depends on the fourth estate doing his fucking job. <laughs> but it's a very good question. You know what you just did? You just did Ben Bradley at the end of the movie, All the President's Men. Nothing's on the line here except for the fate of America, the presidency, and the U.S. Constitution. There's a couple things. First of all, the media quote unquote, is not all inherently bad. It's like the FBI. It's like any large organization of lots of things. Most of the people, if many, if not most of the people who do these jobs are really good, are really honorable and have done crack work. So I was able to write my book in 2018 because of media reporting. The thing that the media always sucks at, it's bad at nuance. It's bad at context. It's bad at providing a big picture of things. And this particular story with the Russian collusion, for want of a better word, there's so many different pieces to it and they come out months apart. They're related, maybe, but they're not obviously related. It would take a news analysis approach to how news is reported, which simply doesn't exist that I'm aware of in any meaningful way. There isn't anybody there connecting all the dots and they know this and they just keep throwing shit out there. Let's put it in really simple terms. He fired the FBI director because he was investigating his Russia ties. And then he invited Russians to the Oval Office the next fucking day. And, and refused let to Americans, let American yeah. media take any pictures. The McGonagall thing. Yeah. So here's the guy at the FBI who's in charge of investigating Russian oligarchs. And he's arrested. And after he leaves the FBI, he's tied in with Deripaska. And so that was a story for like six minutes. And now we haven't heard another thing about it. Why, why aren't the connections being made? You don't want to rush to judgment and make assumptions that we don't know. Now, we do know that Deripaska is involved. We do know that Deripaska's American properties were raided in October of, I think, 21. And then this guy's phones were seized like three weeks later. That we know. That seems like it's probably related because they, and we know that they indicted him. And they're not going to indict 
in my opinion, an ex-FBI executive like this, unless he's really fucked up. So I think we can assume that he did what he did. The real question with this guy is the larger question of the whole New York field office of the FBI and its Trumplandia reputation and how they basically took that Anthony Weiner laptop story and forced Comey, coerced him to write that memo, which is not something that you want to do. And that actually, can, can we pause on that for one mm -hmm. second? Let's just hit that for a second. So what you're saying is that we know that when Comey, 10 days before the election, FBI director James Comey, 10 days before the 2016 election announced that he was reopening an investigation into Hillary Clinton. We know that action had significant consequences. It may have cost Hillary Clinton the election. That is certainly the conclusion of the 538 website that looked at it and found that it cost her three to four points, including in critical swing states. So that Comey thing begs the question, why? Why did he announce that? 10 days before the election. What you were just saying is that there has been substantial reporting, including in The Guardian, that he did it under duress because he believed that the New York field office in which the agents were demonstrably pro-Trump and anti-Clinton, that they were going to leak this anyway. And they essentially held a metaphorical gun to his head and said, if you don't announce this, we're going to leak it, which is going to be even worse. So he figured he might as well say it and gain some control of it. Is that, did I summarize that right? I think you summarized it perfectly as far as I know. And this is something he's written about in his book. Comey had, was between a rock and a hard place. He was afraid that they would release this laptop. There would be shit on there and he would look like he was helping Hillary. Mm. So the mistake he made is that he should have just announced both of the investigations at the same time. As we know, Crossfire Hurricane was going on simultaneously, which was a huge counterintelligence investigation into Trump and his ties to Russia, led by Pete Strzok, by the way, who was our guest last week on the 5-8. Such uh, a good watch. People, yeah. check this out. <laughs> the, I'm serious. I know I'm supposed to be promoting my own YouTube channel. Subscribe to Blue Amp, please subscribe yeah. to Blue Amp if you're enjoying this conversation, but also go check out that Pete Strzok conversation. It's like in, in Harry Potter, it's the dark arts professor is always the one that winds up hooking up with Baltimore. I remember exactly. what I was going to say. Paul, you asked a question before about why did this guy do this? FBI directors have done this in the past. That was Louis Free went and worked for Semyon Mogilevich, who was the head of the Russian mob. And uh, was thought to be a confidential informant, the FBI, and after he retired, just went and worked for him. So this is something that happens with these top ranking members. And when you have that leadership there, when you have, hey, we're going to be, we're going to treat these outfits with kid gloves. It's the same thing goes for Trump in the New York field office, the head of the field office. And Craig Unger writes about this a lot in the book, this guy, James Kallstrom, Trump had cultivated him since the seventies and when he was still just a, an agent and he was in charge of the field office. So when you have people at the top of organizations who you know are pro-Trump or whatever it is that they are, it's hard to make inroads in that. And it's the same thing with the media. The group think is that Trump was a clown. He's this reality star. He's a buffoon. He's not really dangerous. Ha ha. It wasn't. This is a guy who's been, whose father was, whose second generation money laundering guy, whose father was mixed up in the crime families in New York City and went into the family business and only got the TV show because he ran out of money. These guys are dangerous. He's, um, was in debt when he started up, really in debt. That's such a great bridge because. You may be asking yourself as you've listened to this or watched it on YouTube, okay, this is a great trip down the way back machine. I am activated. I am enraged. We screwed this up. Why does it matter now in 2023? And I think the answer is twofold. One, obviously this dipshit is running for president again. Duh. But the other reason is I'm what disturbs me about it and what I think the McGonagall situation raises is we we feel like the russia story is old news because they've adopted the football strategy they flooded the zone there's so much stuff it's hard to follow and it feels like the cliche from an action movie it's quiet a little too quiet so there was this profusion of russian very overt very obvious interference and infiltration in American elections starting around 
2016. It was all on the surface. And there was the super duper obvious stuff like the firing Comey episode and inviting Russians to go la laugh and dance on his grave. And since then, it's gone much quieter. And so there are two possibilities. One is Vladimir Putin said, you know what? That was so much fun. Remember the good old days when we were doing that thing? Yeah, that was great. We've closed up shop. We're done with all that. The other possibility is the super duper obvious one, which is they're still doing all this stuff, but they've learned something and they're just, they're being more covert about it. And even then there's still stuff seeping through like the fact that, and I don't know how I didn't put this together until recently, but there's been so much reporting on the Wagner group, which is the paramilitary unit that's essentially leading the Russian fight in Ukraine. Just and put on the terrorist list. Just sanctioned. Just, exactly, Paul. Exactly. And it's run by a Russian businessman who's actually a caterer by trade, Evgeny Prigozhin. He came out and said it. He said the quiet part out loud. He was quoted by the Associated Press November 7th of 2022 saying that he's openly bragging. Oh, yes, we're still interfering in U.S. elections. I'm the guy who's leading it. And so you have this Russian invasion of Ukraine. And the same guy who's leading the military operations there has also been tasked by Putin to lead Russian attacks on U.S. democracy. So we know it's all happening. How worried are you about the amount that we are not seeing? These are all good points. I'm glad you brought all this stuff up because I had jotted down notes that you touched on some of the things. First of all, let's talk about Prigozhin, who's Putin's chef, he's known as. The thing about Prigozhin is that he's not a member of the government. He's basically a dude. He's just a guy who has a business. So there's a remove between him and Putin. The other piece is um, the Ukraine piece, okay? And I think this is an easy thing for people to see, that what's going on there is atrocious. It's war crimes. It's horrors. I've written on my Substack about the similarities between, or the parallels between what Putin is doing in Ukraine and what Hitler did in Germany. And they're very eerily overlap, I think, to the point where Putin's doing it intentionally. But right now, it's a litmus test, I think, for people in the United States. Anybody that's watching our politicians, you can tell if someone's on the side of democracy or on the side of fascism based on what they say about the war. If you have a Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's literally just trumpeting Kremlin talking points about Ukraine and saying that it's a waste of money and it's what do we care and blah, 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 and Zelensky's a thug or whatever she's saying, you know she's not working for the United States. She's not on the side of democracy. She's not on the side of America. She's, whether wittingly, unwittingly, I have no idea, she is carrying water for Putin. So it's very easy now, I think, where it wasn't in 2016 to look at these people and say, oh, you're saying this is, I know this is bullshit. This is a Russian talking point. If you say something and you're a politician and then you appear on Russian TV and they're talking about how great you are, that's a bad look. You should know as an American, that person is not taking our side. So I don't think the war in Ukraine has any ambiguity to it at all. It's a Russia invaded a sovereign nation, which you're not allowed to do. It's a violation of all national, international order and got their ass kicked pretty quickly and now is just trying to do as much collateral damage as possible. That's what they're doing. It's not, there's not, there's no justification for the invasion. Nothing that he's saying has worked. He's walked back and revamped the explanations three or four or five times by now. I think when Biden initially said, hey, Putin is going to do this on such and such a day, I think it blew Putin's mind that we were so up in his comms and I don't think he's ever recovered. I think Biden, by the way, has done a wonderful job with Putin in Ukraine. I wish he did a, is doing a better job with Putin here, but that will take at least he's doing a good job on the Ukraine front. So back to your question is, am I worried? I'm definitely worried because the Department of Justice isn't arresting anybody. We know all these people committed crimes. Trump stole the classified documents. I get that the insurrection, trying to pin that on him is complicated. Stealing shit you're not supposed to have is not complicated. I talk to lawyer friends and they're like, this is an open shut case. Anybody who just passes the bar could try this. It's one it's one witness. Hey, FBI guy that searched the property. Did you find the stuff? Uh-huh. Okay, you're witness. There's no ambiguity to it, but Merrick Garland didn't want to do anything about it. Now we're waiting on this Jack Smith guy. I don't know what's going to happen, but if they start indicting people, we're okay. If they don't, then 
Trump is going to continue to do what Mogilevich has done in Russia, which is repeating the line, if I'm such a crook, if I'm such a bad guy, why have I never been charged with a crime? Greg Oliar, I know we have to get you out of here. So let me leave people on this thought. If <laughs> listening to all of this has been frustrating for you, if it's been, if it's prompted the question of how do we stop this? How do we put a spike in it? I want to go back to something Greg said a moment ago, which is the media in general is not all bad. As a matter of fact, they are a tremendous force for good. Even beginning to criticize them helped bring down the American flag behind me. And they will pay attention to what the public demands they pay attention to. And we can demand that with our actions, our eyeballs, and our attention. If this story, if this is something that you want the media to pay more attention to, then I know this is self-serving, but share this episode with people. Go and subscribe to the Blue Amp channel and go and check out the 5-8. Yeah, we have a live YouTube show. It's called the 5-8. And it's called that because it's on at five o'clock in LA, eight o'clock in New York. It's on Friday nights live. It's me and my co-host and friend, Stephanie Koff, who on Twitter is Lincoln's Bible, um, who's done extensive work on Trump's connection, especially to organized crime. The point is, if we, with our feet and our eyeballs and our attention, vote for in the marketplace, this is important. We care about this. We're paying attention to it. And therefore, the mainstream media needs to as well. If they want our attention, then talk more about this, dig more into it. Then that's the action that you can take right there. That was also my attempt at a clever end of the show. Greg O'Leary, thank you so much for running through all of this with us. Oh, thanks so much for having me. This was a pleasure, guys. <laughs>